Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Medical College of Wisconsin's Coffee Conversations with Scientists, where each month MCW brings you the science behind the health topics you're hearing about in the news. The series is brought to you by Advancing Healthier Wisconsin Endowment, a statewide nonprofit that is working to improve health and advance health equity in Wisconsin. I'm Dr. Stuart Wong, a medical oncologist and director of the Medical College of Wisconsin's Center for Disease Prevention Research and your host today. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here to talk to Dr. Rania Dempsey, a lifestyle medicine physician about the science behind plant-based nutrition and tips on how to get started with some simple lifestyle modifications to improve your overall health. Dr. Dempsey received her MD from the University of Chicago and completed her internship and residency in internal medicine at Northwestern University. She completed a fellowship in primary care sports medicine and an MS in epi epidemiology also at the Medical College of Wisconsin. In 2017, she was among the first two of approximately 250 physicians in the world to become board certified in lifestyle medicine. Welcome, Dr. Dempsey. Thank you, Dr. Wong. It's, I'm really excited to be here with you. Well, it's great to have you here. Um, I, it, I've got a, a, a bunch of questions that I think um, our, our listeners will really love to hear. Um, every time I talk to you, um, I learn something new. And so um, I, this is going to be great. Um, I encourage all of our uh, listeners and watchers to um, ask questions. Please put those in the comments and we'll get to as many of those as we possibly can. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Right. Um, so maybe a good starting point is you can just tell us what lifestyle medicine is. You know, that's actually a, a very good starting point because I think even many physicians aren't really comfortable with what lifestyle medicine is. So um, lifestyle medicine doctors address and treat many of the same conditions that, that many other doctors treat. We address high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, high cholesterol, but instead of using traditional approaches like pills or procedures or surgeries, we use things like evidence-based lifestyle interventions. So we might prescribe nutrition or exercise or um, stress reduction strategies like mindfulness, deep breathing techniques, restful sleep. Um, we even prescribe time in nature. We prescribe social connection. And we do this because the evidence shows that this is a really effective way to address disease. So um, instead of sort of looking at reducing symptoms or um, slowing the progression of disease with medications or with surgeries, we actually want to address the root causes, the underlying causes of, of disease. And we know that 80 to 90% of chronic diseases are related to lifestyle. So if we can address those root causes, we can hope to actually prevent, treat, and in many cases, even reverse disease. So that's kind of in a nutshell what lifestyle medicine physicians do. Great. We'll talk about uh, health topics that are in the news. Uh, nutrition and wellness are, you know, really out there. Uh, um, we hear about it and read about it all the time. But I, I think that there is maybe a little bit of confusion about the terminology. Um, we hear plant-based diets and we hear vegan and, and uh, plant-based whole food um, diets. Can you describe um, what these terms mean? And is there scientific evidence to suggest that one is better than another? That's a great question. <laughs> and um, so plant-based diet is um, a general term for exactly what it sounds like. So a plant-based diet is a diet that is based primarily on plants. So it can be a plant exclusive diet, um, one that does include any animal foods. It can be a plant foundational diet where plants are the vast majority of what's, what's included, but there also may be small um, amounts of animal foods that are eaten as well. And I think the important distinction between a plant-based diet versus, for example, a vegan diet is that um, in plant-based diets, we really emphasize what we're including. So it's about bringing in abundant plant foods, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, legumes, intact grains, and all these foods that give us lots of nutritional value. Um, we're emphasizing adding those things in because isn't it a lot more fun to think about what, what to add in versus what we have to restrict. So that's, that's part of, um, that's the difference between a plant-based versus a strictly vegan diet. Um, the other, I think, important distinction, one of the most people who talk about plant-based eating do mean a 
um, an emphasis on foods as close as possible to their form found in nature. So we emphasize minimally processed or unprocessed plant foods. Um, but there is a subset of a plant-based diet that's known as specifically a diet called the whole food plant-based diet. And that is a, an actual slightly different um, diet in that it um, is plant exclusive. Um, it's also doesn't include any um, oils, any processed oils, even um, or and even some plant-based foods are um, restricted. Uh, plant, excuse me, plant-based high-fat foods like avocados may be limited, things like that. So that is just one subset of a plant-based diet um, that. Um, that we refer to and people may have heard, it's been made popular by movies like The Game Changers and Fork Silver Knives. Um, as for the science between um, which of those might be the best, a lot of the research we do sort of puts all of the categories into plant-based diets. So we haven't really, unfortunately, there's very limited research telling us um, is one clearly superior to the other. Um, there are a group of doctors who have been doing more and more research specifically on a whole food plant-based diet, but the reality is we've never done a head-to-head -head comparison of a 100% whole food plant-based diet that's low fat and excludes oils with a plant-based diet that uh, includes other whole plant foods, but may have small amounts of oils or, or animal foods. So I'd love to see that study. I'd love to have it be done. But in the meantime, I think anyone shifting towards more plant-based is going to be it's going to be seeing benefits. So, okay. So let's say um, a patient comes to you and says, okay, I want to make this change. I've, I've decided I'm going to do it. Is it best that they do it gradually or abruptly? Is there a, a, a technique that probably is more successful than the other? Well, either technique can be successful given differences in individuals. Um, for most people, I recommend gradual changes. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, one upside of making abrupt changes is most people coming from a standard American diet, transitioning to a plant-based diet are gonna feel really good, really fast. So they're gonna have, you know, they're constipated, that's gonna go away. Heartburn is gonna feel significantly better. Um, they're gonna have a lot of immediate feedback in health markers like their cholesterol, their blood pressure, the blood sugars are gonna normalize or decrease pretty rapidly, even within a matter of weeks. So that can give a lot of positive feedback and it can be a big motivator for people who are in a position where they wanna make rapid changes. The, the time I've seen that be successful is most often in situations like um, soon after a health scare, where mm -hmm. someone's maybe been recently hospitalized, maybe even had a heart attack, and they're really in a mindset where they are going to devote their life to making these lifestyle changes and making them all the way. They may have a partner who's also a little bit scared and is willing to support them in these changes. So in that situation, I've seen abrupt changes be sustainable and be sustainable be um, successful. But for most people who have real lives and real jobs and other commitments, I recommend making gradual changes. And um, what, one of the, I, I actually use the term, I borrow it from Shauna Shapiro, who is a, a researcher who um, writes about mindful self-compassion. And she encourages us to set ridiculously unambitious goals and then build <laughs> successes. And I think that helps us really feel more powerful, more empowered, more, um, more confidence, more self-efficacy if we set goals that are achievable and we can okay. build on those and build on those successes. That's great. I love that phrase. Um, all right. Well, let's say that you're a patient that has some baseline diabetes or hypertension, or let's say you don't have any of those. In either of those scenarios, do you recommend that a patient should see their primary care physician before embarking upon a major dietary shift? Well, Dr. Wong, you, you know that it's a pet peeve of mine that we have to put all these warning labels on switching to a healthy lifestyle. So, you know, we have to warn people when they begin an exercise program that, you know, check with your physician before you make any changes. And that's sort of a pet peeve because we don't require warning labels on unhealthy lifestyles. We don't make people check with their doctor before beginning a sedentary lifestyle or an unhealthy diet. But that being said, I do actually recommend that people check in with their doctor um, before they begin um, or make changes, dietary changes. One of the major reasons is that particularly for people who are on medications for high blood pressure, for blood sugar control, those um, medications may, they may not be able to sustain the same high doses that they run because as their, their physiology, their body um, 
lower their blood pressure lowers and their blood sugar stabilize, they may need adjustments in their medication. So I think it's always a good idea to check with your healthcare provider when you're, when you're taking on any significant lifestyle changes. Great. Sometimes I hear about patients that are interested in um, following a plant-based diet, but they have certain fears. And maybe one fear is that they're afraid of being hunger, hungry all the time. Do you have any thoughts about what you would recommend to a patient that expresses that sort of trepidation? I think it's a, it's a real valid concern for people that um, are going to a restaurant and, and trying to order off a menu that has no plant-based options. And the only thing available to them is a side iceberg lettuce salad. That <laughs> could be an issue. But I think um, it's really a, um, important to remember that a plant-based diet, one of the great things about it is that we don't, we don't put restrictions on the amount of food you can eat. So because plants tend to be much um, lower energy compared to energy per calorie compared to, excuse me, per volume compared to other foods, we can actually eat a pretty large volume of, of plant foods without eating more than our bodies need physiologically. So I remind people, you don't have to count calories or, or measure portion sizes. You just eat until you feel satisfied. So that's one important sort of piece to remember. The other thing is plant foods are really full of fiber. So as long as you're picking the right ones, it's not just the iceberg lettuce salad, but intact grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, fruits, vegetables, and a wide variety and lots of different colors and textures, you really are going to have a ton of fiber in your diet that's going to help you feel very satisfied from meal to meal. And research has supported that, that eating a high fiber diet does delay um, to help us feel more satisfied and then delay hunger for, for later in the day. So I urge them to just try it because yeah. I think they'll be surprised that they won't feel hungry all the time if they're eating a well-planned plant-based diet. Well, well, that's been my experience. I, I actually feel like I don't have to worry at all about counting calories and it's, it's a simple uh, formula. Uh, and also I feel like I probably have a wider palette of foods that I eat now than how I used to eat. Um, so can I ask you, what are your thoughts about, you know, using the word diet um, versus nutritional plan or something else? Uh, does it have any negative connotation to you? The word diet in and of itself does have a negative connotation. I use it more in the context of, for example, eucalyptus is part is the diet of koalas, you know, it, meaning that it defines a pattern that, that people follow, but I don't like the term diet um, that connotates a short term sort of, I'm going to do this until I'm reach a often external goal, like a particular size or a particular weight. Um, that's not what a plant-based lifestyle is. We're really about changing the way we interact with food, changing the way we think about food and, and doing something that's going to be with us for the rest of our lives. So this is not a, not a short-term diet. Um, so one of the other issues that some patients may have about making a, um, a lifestyle modification like this is how is it going to affect their pocketbook? Uh, is this going to have a negative impact or is it going to be a positive impact on their daily, um, gross or weekly grocery bills? I think some people have a misconception that a plant-based diet can be more expensive or even elitist which I think arises from the, the um, truth that organic produce can be really expensive. Fresh organic produce can be certainly. Um, but I think when you look at the overall um, costs of a plant-based diet, you know, most sources of plant-based protein are significantly less expensive than, than animal protein. So dried beans, legumes, intact grains, these are all sources of protein that both per serving size and per gram of protein cost significantly less than, than meat and other animal proteins. So that's a, a potential big area for savings right there. Um, depending on the other way, you know, shopping seasonally, using frozen produce when it's, um, you know, available uh, versus trying to buy the expensive out of season produce or other great ways to, but I think overall, um, a plant-based diet can be extremely affordable and, and even money saving. And that's not even addressing the costs that we save at a societal level by healthcare expenditures, the cost to the planet from animal food-based diets. So I think that that's, that's another really important cost-saving measure that, that comes from a plant-based diet. Great. Uh, so there's a few questions in the chat about um, protein and calcium supplementation in a plant-based diet. Um, 
are we getting enough calcium by following a pretty strict plant-based diet? And what about protein? Are we um, getting enough protein or are there tricks that you use to make sure you're getting enough of um, each of those components? Um, let's take, break those two down and, and talk about them separately. So protein is a, a pretty common question I get. Um, and I'm not sure what has started this myth around protein, but we have an idea in the United States that we just are not getting enough protein often. And that's not, it's just not true. Um, it's really, really hard to be protein deficient if you're not calorie deficient. Now we have seen some recent data and maybe people have even seen it in the news um, coming out about older people needing more protein and being protein deficient. But for the vast majority of the, that research and that evaluation that was done, um, found that the, the protein deficiencies that were being seen were in people who had a very poor qual diet quality overall. Um, and it was, not, it was not at all related to eating a plant-based diet. So um, a well-planned um, plant-based diet is, is absolutely adequate for protein. Um, there's no, we used to think, you know, 30 years ago or so, and some people still um, have, have heard that proteins need to be paired in a certain way to make sure we're getting all the essential amino acids at the same time. We know that's not how the body works now. The body is really efficient at pulling out the amino acids it needs from different foods. So if you have some of your amino acids at breakfast and a couple of different ones at dinner, that's absolutely fine to, um, in terms of getting enough protein. And it's just a matter of um, making sure that it's a well-planned, balanced diet. So protein is generally not a concern, even for athletes. Um, this, there's a, official statements by various organizations that um, plant-based diets are absolutely appropriate for athletes um, and for older people as, as long as they're well-planned. Um, calcium can be a little bit um, also fully available through food sources, but not quite as easy. Um, it, it takes a little bit more planning in terms of looking for calcium rich foods like bok choy and broccoli and almonds and tofu. Um, those are all great plant-based sources of calcium. Um, I do encourage people to talk with their doctor about calcium supplementation if they feel like they're having trouble getting um, some of those calcium based foods. But I prefer to try to get um, calcium through food sources. A lot of the plant milks now are, be, are becoming fortified with calcium. So that's another uh, place for potential um, diet based, plant based calcium. There's a lot of questions about um, uh, protein with respect to um, alternative sources of protein. And I guess you see this in the news more and more. Uh, for instance, the Kentucky Fried Chicken, chicken um, <laughs> nuggets uh, that are plant-based. And also there's Impossible Burgers and Beyond Burgers. Uh, what do you think about these protein um, replacements or animal replacements for protein? Um. I personally don't just don't like them, <laughs> but that's because I haven't eaten meat for more than 35 years. So I just don't have a taste for that. And I, I, um, you know, don't, don't feel like replacing something that I really don't have a taste for anyway. But, um, I will say my, my kids like them and there can be a place for them in a plant-based, um, lifestyle. There's certainly still a, a processed food. So they're, they're, um, you know, need to be thought of as maybe a sometimes food or a, a food that we have on occasion versus a staple of a healthy plant-based diet. But for people who really want that um, sort of feel of having a burger or, or fried chicken, you know, treating them as a sometimes treat with, you know, with the processing that they are, um, they're certainly easier on the planet than, than farmed, um, you know, than meat-based products. So I say, if it works for you, <laughs> Go for it. So um, there um, seems to be um, a trend um, of people wanting to be on a high protein and low carb diet uh, as a weight loss strategy. Is that a sort of diet uh, strategy that's compatible with a plant-based nutrition plan? <laughs> I guess let me address that question a couple different different or from one approach and see if I'm answering what you're, what you're getting at. Um, research has shown us that just about anything can help us lose weight. So you can be on a high carb, low fat diet. You can be on a high protein, low carb diet, really, really um, 12 months after being on, on any weight loss diet, um, 
the same percentage of people will have lost weight and kept it off, which is sadly actually not a whole lot um, from these traditional dietary interventions. Um, and so I, I guess you're asking, is there such a thing as a high protein, low carb plant-based diet? Correct. You know, not a balanced one, I would say, <laughs> I guess. Um, it, part of the really important part about a plant-based diet is that it just includes what we talked about earlier, that you don't have to limit calorie counts or portion sizes per se. It's just eating abundant plant foods. And so I think eating a very, very high protein plant diet probably wouldn't be a, a, a well-balanced plant diet. Plants are naturally so high in good quality carbohydrates, the carbohydrates that have lots of phytonutrients and antioxidants and fiber and that give us all kinds of healthy things that come with it. So I think limiting that would sort of take away the benefit of a plant-based diet or a lot of the benefits. Um, certainly it would be effective for losing weight because as long as we're using weight loss strategies, people can lose weight in the short term, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend that for a, a long-term lifestyle change. Yeah, there's some a lot of really interesting research in that subject, and the history of, of that is also very interesting. Um, uh, it, it seems that some of that comes from the Atkins diet, and that um, what hadn't been studied ex very extensively is the um, long-term health benefits of that strategy. It does have short-term gains, but um, long-term uh, potential risks, I think, is uh, what, what many nutritionists uh, fear about that uh, dietary strategy. Um, so what would you recommend for somebody who simply doesn't like vegetables? Um, maybe that they're um, a, a fearful of making this change because they would be so restricted in their diet by um, eating foods that don't give them a lot of pleasure. That's a valid concern. Um, Unfortunately, we, we know that tastes are formed really early in life. So what your mother ate when she was pregnant with you or when she nursed you is going to impact your preferences and tastes in, in childhood and adulthood. So if you were raised by parents who didn't like vegetables very much and you didn't get a lot of exposure to them, there's a decent chance that you're, you know, you may not like as wide a variety of vegetables as someone who had a different exposure in childhood. But the good news is that um, there's a lot of research in children about how to, how to expand their palate and how to help them, them grow to like things that they haven't liked in the past. And I think a lot of that, there hasn't been as much research in adults, but in my anecdotal experience, these techniques do work in adults as well. Um, one is the old, we've heard it said many times, and I found it to be true that it, on average, it takes between 12 and 20 exposures to a new food to like that new food. So just because you've tried a vegetable and you don't necessarily like it. Don't give up on continuing to introduce it in different ways and different forms. The other thing, this, there was actually a really um, great study done looking at kids and introducing them to new foods. And we found that when we um, introduce a new food alongside a very familiar or a palatable food, children are much more likely to accept that, that new food. So this particular study was done with um, introducing children to Brussels sprouts. So one group of kids was randomized to get just plain Brussels sprouts and the other got Brussels sprouts that were just smothered in cheese sauce. This wasn't a specific plant-based study, but um, it was just a, a um, way to see how if they could broaden the children's palates at all. And not surprisingly, the children who had the Brussels sprouts smothered in cheese sauce liked them more, but they came back a week later and again, gave plain Brussels sprouts to both groups. And again, the children who had had the Brussels sprouts the first time with cheese sauce were more likely to say that they liked Brussels sprouts later. So I think that trick can work for adults, really not trying to make food perfect the first time in the, the healthiest, best way we could do it, or really to make it something that's either familiar, if we have a sweet tooth, maybe drizzling a little maple syrup on it, but you know, whatever it is, or really make us feel like, okay, that food isn't going to be quite so bad. <laughs> and then over time, um, we often grow to, to enjoy that food. And the last just quick point I make is that um, I've had people come to me, you know, in, in my office who say, I just don't like vegetables. There's nothing that I like, but I have a, a sheet of paper that lists all the vegetables that I could think of by alphabetical orders. There's, you know, 50 or 70 vegetables on this, on this sheet. And we go down one by one and I have them put a little star next to the ones that they like. And I haven't had a single person yet not have 
any vegetable that they say they like. Usually, you know, it's maybe it's carrots or peas or something, but everyone has at least one thing that they like. And so I, I encourage them to build on that success. You know, if there is something you like, one or two or three vegetables you like, it's okay to have a lot of those as you build your palate to like other ones as well. Okay, so there are some questions in the comments related to your last answer. Um, is it safe uh, and or beneficial for kids to follow a plant-based diet so early in life? Um, according to, well, <laughs> I'd say it's a whole lot safer than the standard American diet. But, <laughs> but yes, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, they've, they've come out with a um, with the statement that plant-based diets are suitable for children of all ages. The American um, Dietetics Association has said the same thing, that plant-based diets, including vegetarian or vegan diets, are safe across the lifespan for all people at all ages and including athletes. So um, it's absolutely safe for sure to, to follow a plant-based diet for children. Of course, it needs to be a well-planned, just like at any age, it needs to be a well-planned plant-based diet that pays attention to particularly the nutrients of, of, that are needed for growth um, and should be done with consultation with a dietitian or a physician to make sure that, that it's a complete diet that, um, that meets nutrient needs as really any diet should be for children. We need to make sure any diet is meeting their nutritional needs. Um, in terms of whether or not it's beneficial, you know, we anecdotally think, well, we've seen these great benefits for, for adults for following up plant-based lifestyle in terms of reduction of heart disease, diabetes, stroke, high cholesterol, et cetera. And, um, so we, know that heart disease and diabetes are diseases that we're seeing in children 35 years ago when, when we were training, these were not diseases of children, excuse me, not heart disease itself, but the plaques that form in, in arteries, we're, we're seeing evidence of this in, in children already. Um, and there are some limited evidence that um, plant-based diets can reverse those markers for heart disease in children, but there's just not a whole lot of, of research data on it yet, so. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, okay, I, Dr. Dempsey, I have a really juicy question for you. Uh, how, uh, somebody asks, um, how would juicing fit into a plant-based diet? And, and to follow up on that, um, are you missing something when you juice? Isn't the, um, the stuff that you leave behind, the fiber and other things uh, uh, important uh, and uh, maybe they shouldn't be excluded from the diet? Um, that's a great point and a great question. I personally um, prefer, for the very reason you brought up, I prefer a, a smoothie to a juice for that very reason that I, I think the more we have foods as close as possible to their form found in nature, the, the more beneficial they are to our bodies. And juicing allows us to take in a whole lot more of certain things than we would be able to in nature. We could never eat, you know, four oranges and three bunches of kale and, and a pound of strawberries in one sitting because there's just too much fiber. We'd be physically full and our, we'd not be able to eat that. And in juicing, we remove the fiber from that. And, um, and so we can have just that amount of, of essentially fruit sugar and other, other um, substances very rapidly and very quickly. So I um, don't, don't necessarily promote juicing. Um, I think that um, I also don't like to take an overly restrictive approach for anything. So is there a place if people enjoy a juice and they want to have it here and there? Absolutely. But again, every time we're shifting the, the nutrition towards plant-based foods as close as possible to their, their form found in nature. So that may be a sometimes food versus thinking of it as a staple or a health promoting food. Um, there's a specific question about, let's say a patient who has uh, type two diabetes. And if they wanted to make this uh, change, wh what would they expect? And is, do you have any specific recommendations for them? Um, in terms of just taking on a, a new plant-based diet and, and yeah. I don't know that there's anything. Um, well, the, the one thing, as I alluded to earlier, is that they should make sure they're monitoring their blood sugars closely, depending on how abruptly they are making these changes they may see quick changes in their blood sugar. Um, one thing I wanna highlight is that um, there's been an idea um, in some literature and in some popular um, publications that um, people with diabetes should avoid fruits and certain grains and um, 
other things that we consider to be high carb foods. That has not been the experience in, in the literature in terms of the, you know, the, the research that's been done on plant-based diets and diabetes. Um, we've actually found that a well-balanced uh, whole food plant-based diet is, is actually very effective for reversing diabetes. So as long as they're including a wide variety of plant-based foods, you know, leafy greens, cruciferous vegetables, intact grains, legumes, um, they absolutely don't need to think about limiting um, intact grains or fruits in, as part of a balanced whole food plant-based diet. And again, checking their blood sugars closely because they may see uh, that that those are um, dropping fairly fairly quickly. Um, you, you touched on this before, but there's another question about um, the whole food plant-based diet where oils are eliminated from the, um, the diet. What are your, your thoughts about that dietary plan? Um, well, the, the pioneers in the field, in my field of lifestyle medicine, are really the people who, who um, put, have put this diet forward. And I have the greatest respect for those, those people, those individuals who promote a whole food plant-based diet. And they really are the leaders in doing um, interventional trials, dietary interventional trials on plant-based diets. There really is more um, research with um, randomizing people to a whole food plant-based diet and looking at um, health outcomes versus almost any other diet besides the Mediterranean diet. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, so I have the utmost respect for them and I would, I would do not um, think that anyone would harm themselves by any means being on a whole food plant-based diet. I think it's a, a extreme, you know, it's been shown to decrease in interventional trials, decrease diabetes. Um, it's effective for weight loss, other, you know, many health outcomes that um, it's been shown in, in research trials. Um, that being said, I think that um, we don't have clear research that it has to be that sort of extreme to use a different term. Um, that it has to be that extreme to be beneficial. So I would love to see, but we've never seen a study comparing a whole food plant-based diet with no oils and exclusively plant-based to, I think I said this earlier, to a really healthy plant-based diet that includes a wide variety of fruits, vegetables, but also includes olive oil. Mm -hmm. In fact, there is evidence from studies in the Mediterranean diet that olive oil may have a beneficial effect for things like preventing Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's, um, the research doesn't quite support us definitively saying that we cannot include any oils or plant-based fats in, in our nutritional plans and our lifestyles. And I also think that um, the less dogmatic we are about how we approach our, our nutritional patterns, the better we feel overall. And, and some people it really works to be, to, to use that sort of extreme approach. But for most of us, it's really about sustaining a healthy relationship with food and not getting too caught up in what we can and can't have. And so I encourage most people to, to do the plant-based sort of degree of plant-based that works for them. Um, following up on that, um, is your experience that um, compliance to a nutritional plan is um, uh, better or worse if you're following that more strict diet where you're excluding oils from, from your diet? I think the people that are successful with the whole food plant-based, oil-free, low-fat plant-based diet um, are really dedicated to what they're doing. And I've seen people be very successful and very, very adherent to that, mm -hmm. that lifestyle um, and become cheerleaders for it. And, and that's, that's awesome. I think most of the people that, that, um, that I've worked with haven't even tried to go, to go to that level, to that, that um, uh, degree of whole food, plant-based, um, oil-free. Um, and, and if someone did, I would have absolutely support them in that. But I've, in, in my experience, I've um, had better luck um, working with people that at a, in a more um, whole food, including whole food, plant-based style, but not in that particular diet. Uh, so there's a question about um, your opinion about raw food diets and what are examples of quote unquote intact grains? Oh, thank you for the question on intact grains. I've used that term, I guess, quite a bit. Um, I use the term intact. We, we hear whole grains a lot and 
technically whole grains are intact grains. I, so I guess I, I want to distinguish, I don't mean uncooked grains in that case. I just mean grains that have not had the parts that provide the extra healthiness removed from them. So grains that still had their hull and their bran as well as the, the endosperm. Um, that, that was maybe a little bit too technical, but their grains as they grow in nature have three different parts. And um, about a hundred years ago, we started removing some of those parts because it gave them a longer shelf life. So if we took out the fat that was found in the germ of the, of the grain, and if we took off the outer casing, it was easier to transport and store those grains. And so we ended up with processed grains essentially that have the same carbohydrate in them, but they're missing the good healthy fats, they're missing the proteins and they're missing most of the fiber that you would find in a, in a whole grain. So I just use the term intact grain to distinguish it from grains that are technically called whole, but sometimes they're taken apart and put back together. And um, it's, it's a complicated process of how our food system works with grains. But um, um, so I, when I say intact grains, I mean things like whole oats or wheat berries or barley that's not been hulled or um, any other quinoa. Great. Quinoa, technically, um, nutritionally, it's a grain, although technically it's a seed, but um, things that are in their form generally as they're found in nature. But they also can be cooked or uncooked. Most grains are better cooked because they're just more palatable and they're more digestible. Um, so when I say intact grains, I'm not referring to uncooked grains. I'm just meaning in their form as they're found in nature without having anything removed or anything added in. Um, finally, could you um, perhaps give us, uh, share with us some examples of your favorite recipes, let's say for uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Sure. Happy to do that. I love to cook. Um, and one thing about myself is I'm pretty simple. So I would be happy eating the same thing day in and day out, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I have also family members who aren't necessarily that way. Um, but let's see for breakfast, almost every day, my go-to breakfast. And I, I don't know if my mother's listening, but this is her go-to breakfast as well. Um, and I, um, I have oats and she cooks hers. I actually like my whole oats uncooked. That's just how I like them. I don't know why. I put some walnuts, cut up some fruit, whatever seasonal today it was apples, but it could be, you know, berries in the summer. Um, and then I pour a little plant milk on it. Um, if I want to shake it up a little, I might sprinkle some chia seeds on it or, um, you know, some ground flax or something. I may get crazy and put raisins on it or other oh, kinds of fruit. Raisins, I, <laughs> I know. know. Um, but I, I generally, that's that's my go-to breakfast. If we have more time, uh -huh. I have, I um, will make uh, whole grain oat flour and sprouted wheat flour pancakes. I'll do, um, I have a tofu scramble that I like to make. Um, with that has it's a little more substance. It's got some black beans and, and tofu in it. Um, so, but generally I keep it pretty simple with, with breakfast. Um, and similarly with lunch, I, there, I have two go-to lunches. One is whatever I made for dinner last night that I'm going to have left <laughs> today. That's probably gonna, my number one. And the other thing I often like to do at lunch is just a giant, I call it the kitchen sink salad. So I fill a huge bowl with whatever greens I have, spinach or romaine lettuce or other, other leafy greens. And then I just put on some kind of beans, so garbanzo beans, white beans, black beans, whatever I have, maybe some sunflower seeds, lots of different vegetables that I can find, whatever I have in the fridge. So carrots, celery, peppers, snap peas, whatever. Um, and I have a, a great balsamic vinegar. I drizzle a little bit of that on and I'm, I'm good to go for a lunch. Um, and then for dinner, it, it really depends. There, there are two ways that, um, that I cook. One is I have to have it done as fast as possible because, you know, everyone's home and I, I, things are chaos and I need to have dinner done in half an hour. So that's sort of one category of, of meal. And then the other, and I, which I love to do this is when we have lots of time and maybe we're all cooking together as a group and we can, you know, come together and, and share in the joy of, of spending time together and um, being in the kitchen together. So that one's the more fun one to answer. So my favorite meal to make for that fun 
family experience is something that my kids call top-notch tacos. They're actually, it's a roasted cauliflower chipotle taco, and it's a very putsy recipe. There's all kinds of, um, you know, pickled red cabbage that has to be made, and then a black bean corn salsa, and the cauliflower has to be roasted. And then we actually make the tortillas homemade from scratch. So the whole sort of, you know, it's a big production. It takes, you know, five people and we're all doing various things and we're making assembly line for the tortillas. And it's, we do that as a sort of an activity that we do together as a family. So we would never take this on, on a weeknight or, you know, during the, during a a school day, but we, um, we do this, you know, for a special occasion to cook together. Um, One of my favorite go-tos when we're in a big hurry is just to put together like a grain and green bowl because it's really quick. So I do a lot of um, prep cook ahead of time where I make batch cook things like wheat berries or brown rice or quinoa, and then may freeze them in smaller portions. So for grain and green bowl, I just throw in a, you know, thaw out some, one of the grains that I've got frozen, pour some beans on top of it, put some greens on top of that, and then season it with whatever I, what I have and put it in front and we're ready to go quickly. And I have these huge bowls that we use so that people get enough to eat and, and feel satisfied with that. But that's just a quick, easy go-to. Well, fantastic. Thanks for sharing those recipes with us. And if people want to find out more information, um, you have a website where a lot of information can be found, I understand. I do. Um, It's drranya.com. Awesome. Yeah. D-R-R-A-N-I-A. Cool. Well, you did not disappoint. I learned tons. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure our audience did as well. And so I, I so appreciate you joining us today. Uh, I want to um, acknowledge uh, uh, Advancing uh, Healthier Wisconsin uh, for sponsoring this, uh, this uh, session. And um, I, I also want to acknowledge uh, that our audience, please stay tuned for our new developments and Uh, the Center for Disease Prevention Research and um, uh, upcoming um, uh, new uh, projects that will bring um, uh, health and health and prevention of disease to um, southeastern Wisconsin. So thanks, everybody. Have a great day.